uh, let's take a look at the match three module because I know that it has a, a bunch of different parameters that you can adjust in order to um, make the game different. Absolutely. Let's switch over to three match. Um, you know, what we try to do in all the modules that we make is make sure that all of the variables, and this makes it easy when you start building out documentation, um, all of the options available for that module are, are pretty much as close to the top as possible, and we try to cluster them all together. So then somebody looking at the code, whether it be another one of our developers or uh, somebody that we might ship this module off to, uh, can see pretty simply that, um, oh, there's an option called rows, there's an option called columns, there's an option called width, there's an option called height, um, there's color options, there's board image options. You might not know what all these do, but and going and looking at the documentation uh, makes sense, but at least here you can kind of see what all the different options are. And just like uh, display new text um, inside of Corona, we're passing um, all of these within an options table, which makes it pretty easy for the end user, um, if we scroll down here to our function, uh, to do something, you know, let's say simple, like overriding the number of rows inside the module. Um, and that's going to cause us to have um, seven rows of uh, three match game, or I can uh, probably also reduce the columns to three, and that'll make um, a big <laughs> wide uh, thing. Let me reduce the rows to three as well, so they're all on the screen at the same time. Now you have one of the easiest three match games ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so passing these different variables make those things, uh, you know, affect um, um, how the module is built. Um, well, that, and, that, and that makes sense, right? Because uh, maybe, maybe for this, uh, this game, you have a thing that says, tell us your age. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm seven. Oh, okay. Well, then we're going to show you that three by three um, grid, right? And you're like, oh, I can now, as a, as a younger child or whatever, I can play the game, um, uh, you know, with a, with a less complex board. Whereas if you're like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 40 years old. You're like, oh, well, you know, I'll give you more, more tiles to, to, to deal with. Yeah. And if you want to localize some of that stuff and kind of what we've done here, um, where we've taken one of these options, uh, we could have passed all these images through that option table, but we just simply added them into our three match Lua file. Uh, again, just to get a little bit of that code outside the main folder. Uh, but if I were to comment this out, uh, the module says, oh, well, I don't have any images now. I wasn't supplied any. So now I'm going to use this color table here and just make circles uh, with those colors. And we get the same kind of functionality, um, you know, three match game. But instead of using the images we placed, um, it's just using uh, display new circles to do that. Um, so this gives you a, a really quick ability without having to have any, um, in fact, I could get rid of the board image as well back there. So um, you're, so if you're just hacking away, just trying to figure this out on your own, like just trying to get the mechanics down, you can create something like this. And then later when your artist gives you the assets, you can just drop it in. Yeah. And this gives, a, you know, I mean, and again, it's all about kind of rapidly prototyping because you might want to sit here and play before your art's done and say, okay, well, you know, um, you know, maybe I want to see what a, um, um, you know, a four by four, um, version of this game looks like and plays like before I go and talk to my artist or try to acquire art, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing just a real quick update here. And I gotta make sure I close my brackets. Um, um, like, oh, well, maybe this might be too, too simple or too easy or, you know, not have enough uh, stuff in it. And if I were to do, um, you know, 12 by 12, maybe that's way too much. And, uh, you know, I can put this on a device and say, oh, a 12 by 12 three match game may be too small uh, for people to actually grab the individual pieces um, and do. So, again, it's about providing that ability to kind of rapidly prototype. Um, also very popular, I think, in a lot of games now, and certainly on um, PC, but uh, more and more in mobile is this idea of having a mini game inside of the game. Um, so something we're doing in, in some of our titles right now as well. 
um, and being able to have a few gameplays like this that are kind of simple game mechanics that you can then, um, you know, put additional graphics to and um, uh, place into your game becomes, um, you know, kind of a value add for people who may want to play a three match game using your intellectual property in your game. Mm. Also uh, procedurally generated maps and levels and, and things like that uh, are popular because then you don't have to sit there and hand code those uh, uh, or uh, update your game in order to, to add more uh, you know, to, the, to the game itself. You can just have it sort of procedurally generated so that the code can generate those things. Yeah, and that's a perfect example. And uh, two of the games that we're working on right now, we use the same procedurally uh, generated level code um, in both games. And every time we make an addition to one, uh, the other one gets all the benefits from it. Um, they use completely different graphics, completely different uh, kind of tile sizes, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, uh, they both get the benefit from sharing that same module. Um, okay, well, so let's talk about some of the other, the other uh, variables, the other parameters that we can pass into this uh, Match 3 module and affect the gameplay. Uh, so the biggest option that you passed to the three match game is a listener. And the listener is very similar to a touch event, a tap event, um, all the other events that uh, you can kind of listen to inside the Corona. Um, and its number one purpose is to actually tell you when a match has been made. And it also provides some other information like what's the image name of the match that got made. Um, how many matches that got made. So if I go in and uh, here I'm going to match four heads, I need to know that four things were matched rather than three things were matched. And in our game Lua, we have a relatively simple function uh, starting here at line 61 that listens to that event um, and starts doing things within our game engine. And so you can see a lot of these modules start coming together um, here in this matched listener. Simply off the bat, I get the phase, which everybody's kind of familiar to, um, that's familiar with programming Corona, um, uh, understands an event phase. Um, you also have this event count. This tells you how many tiles were actually, actually matched and this event.image that tells you what image was matched. So if a space key is matched, what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna add 1500 to your score. We wanna play the audio uh, associated with the key. Um, you know, if there was a crate on screen and you haven't collected it yet, we're going to blow that crate up and then move on to the next level. Um, if you match a space glove or a space gun, which are two attack tiles, um, um, we're going to play that laser sound. If there's an alien on the screen and the alien still has the ability to be hurt, then we're going to play a hit sound. We're going to hurt that alien. We're going to add 500 to your score. Um, and then we've shown this before, if I have, um, if I match three monster tiles um, and there is an alien on the screen and he's still alive, then we're going to play the hit alien sound. We're going to shake the hallway. We're going to flash the screen red. Um, this is part of our effects module. And we're going to call that heart module with one point of damage. Um, if that uh, takes us down to zero, then we're going to exit the game. Um, if not, um, and then we're going to have the uh, audio of the alien sound play. And so we'll do that here. So we took a little bit of damage. If I match three things here, he takes a little bit of damage. Um, and we have another little module here that we haven't really talked about because it's attached to the alien, but it's a health bar. Um, very similar to the heart bar, but just visualizes with um, a couple rectangles rather than visualizing with hearts uh, that kind of keeps track of uh, how much uh, health is left. Um, for an alien. Um, yeah, so you can see that this, uh, you know, one little listener function, only about 40 lines of code, uh, basically is all the gameplay logic. Um, getting a return from this, letting you know when something's been matched, and then doing something different to all the other modules that are here based on what piece got matched. You know, one of the other reasons of using kind of this modular kind of effect, um, if I can get one of those aliens to show back up again, um, is this kind of health bar for this um, um, alien actually gets created inside his instance, right? So notice how the health bar isn't called from that main function. It's actually called from inside the monster because the monster is the only person that gets a health bar. 
and I want that health bar to be uh, attached to him, right? So, because uh, what we could easily do is put two or three or four monsters on screen. Okay. And we'd want them all, all to have their own health bar and we'd want those health bars all to be independent of each other. So they'd all be new instances. And this is just kind of this idea of daisy chaining instances together. So, you know, this instance is the monster type and it has its own bar associated with it, which gets a new health bar. And we actually insert that health bar into the monsters display group. We said it's X and Y. And then if you were to go back and kind of move this monster around that health bar, since it's attached to its group, would follow them all over the place, which we use a lot inside of uh, Skip Chaser. You know, every monster in Skip Chaser has its own health bar over its head, which keeps track of how much hit points it has. And when you shoot it, those bars kind of go down. Um, so it becomes a really, you know, interesting because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very short, you know, very small code base. But when you blow up like 15 instances of an enemy and 15 instances of health bars on top of them, mm -hmm. um, it looks like this really complicated, you know, huge, um, you know, like, oh, how did you keep track of all that stuff? And it's like, oh, I'm not really keeping track of it at all. It's all happening because, you know, I've stacked these modules on top of each other and I've made them so, you know, they're not relying on any global variable. They just kind of go and do their own thing. 